Hi guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today we will take a look at some new Mauritius Comprise content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now let's dive right into the stories. First one is titled, "But it's not a house." I heard this story from my uncle last week. It made me laugh, so I thought I'd share it. My uncle is a farmer in rural Ohio and has a lot of Amish neighbors. Earlier this year, one of them purchased an old farmhouse not far from my uncle's house. They got into a conversation about what his plans for the property were. The Amishman said the house was in pretty bad shape, but came with a few dozen acres of surrounding land, and he was planning on just removing the house and using the property as farmland. He figured that the cheapest and quickest solution was just to burn the house down. Uncle, well there, I'm not sure that's legal. Amishman, why not? I own the house. There are no other houses nearby that could be damaged. It won't hurt anyone. Uncle, I don't disagree, but the county has regulations about how buildings can be demolished. I'm pretty sure that burning down a building is not allowed, even if you own it. You should check with the county sheriff's office first. So, the Amishman borrowed my uncle's phone to call the sheriff's office, and it turns out my uncle was right. The sheriff told him that if he set the house on fire, he would have to pay a hefty fine. The Amishman was not very pleased but thanked my uncle for letting him know. A few weeks passed and nothing happened. Then my uncle was driving home one day and saw that the house had been demolished. It looked to him like someone had just pushed it over with a bulldozer because what was left was a large pile of lumber and roofing and vinyl siding. My uncle assumed they would be paying someone else to haul the wreckage away. And yes, before you say so, I know the Amish can't use bulldozers, but they really have a lot of loopholes in that system of theirs. They can't own modern technology, but there seems to be no prohibition against borrowing or hiring modern technology. Anyway, during work the next day, my uncle sees an enormous column of black smoke rising into the sky. Alarmed, he hops into his truck and follows the smoke cloud and discovers a large crowd of Amish watching a giant greasy bonfire that was the remains of the house. My uncle finds his neighbor in the crowd and walks over. Uncle, so you decided to burn it after all? Amishman, eye up. Uncle, what are you going to do when the sheriff comes? Amishman, he already came and went. Uncle, and? Amishman, well he told me that he'd have to find me for burning down my house, and I said, but it's not a house, it's just a pile of garbage. Burning your garbage is legal in their county, my uncle routinely does it himself. Uncle, what the sheriff say? The Amishman smiled slowly. There wasn't anything he could say. He got into his car and drove away. Next one is titled, Brand new manager tries to fire me. Let's see how this ends. I'm a 100% disabled vet, but I still wanted to work for as long as I can. I worked in a large company that contracted to many of the big oil companies. For years, I had excellent reviews and the customers loved me. My manager got promoted and one of my coworkers became the newly promoted manager. He started out fine but then as he went through management training, he became the boss people hate. He was trying to flex his muscles by using all the usual tricks of setting you up to fail in order to fire me and a couple others. Why? I have no idea. One day at work, I had a major medical emergency that left the right half my body with no feeling at all, completely numb. That took me out of the office for several weeks while they used steroids to try and help sort out the issue. A couple months and an MRI and spinal tap later they discovered I had multiple sclerosis. After I was diagnosed, he decided to pull me out of the customer site and have me work in the office. My job had zero office work, I spent nearly a year in the office getting paid to do stupid mind-numbing BS while he tried to figure out how a way to fire me. Since the initial issue was medical it proved to be very difficult, so he would try to assign me to long-term duties, like six months, one hundreds of miles from home knowing I could not do them. He also was not picking any menial task I did not perform to his liking. He knew I could not travel as I have to see several doctors every month, and I can only refill medications from my local VA clinic. While he was trying to fire me, I was talking to HR about my disability and how it's obvious that I could no longer perform my job for safety concerns. That was the reason my boss pulled me into the office. I also informed HR about how the manager treated me and several other employees. 
They had me do several things including sending my medical records to a company medical doctor to make sure I was being honest I assume. In the end, HR decided to put me out on pre-approved early retirement with short and long-term disability. Now I will get paid from the company till I am 67. All before he could get to the chance of firing me. Additionally, several other workers quit around the same time as me and a short time after I left, he was replaced by a different co-worker. Thanks boss. Next one is titled, Use the law to withhold my deposit? Well okay, here we go. This was a few years ago, so some of the details are a little fuzzy, but I smile every time I think about this. I moved to California in 2010 and had lined up a house on a three-acre property with a nice-sized detached barn. We were on a rent-to-own to allow time to get settled and secure the loan to buy the property. So, we had a standard California rental agreement. With the handshake agreement, it would not be needed once we purchased the house. A couple little things to fill in. The female owner was a realtor, so there was a reasonable expectation she knew what she was doing. The husband was weird. I cannot explain it past that. But part of the agreement was we actually bought the horse that was boarded on the property and also, they had the detached barn full of their old crap, with the agreement that it would be removed by the owners once we purchased. So, we move in, things are going fairly well. We have several cats at the time, but keep the house cleaned up, and we had one cat prone to accidents, but for the most part, we kept everything good. Sometime during the winter, we have an issue with the septic system. The owner proceeds to let it slip the septic was not put in legally and was not correct. Okay, they still pay for the repairs. A month or so later, a water line the husband installed to use for watering the horse broke and again, find out it was not done correctly. This time, I was forced to pay for it. Okay, cool. Once I found out about the septic, I started looking for other houses and found one available, and we were able to get it. At this point, I give the owner about two months notice. We had done some improvements on the property, including a tack shed, for all the horse gear, my stepdaughter loved horses, and the horse was hers. So almost immediately, the owner's attitude changes and I realize we are in for a long two months. We are slowly moving into the new house as we have time. During this time, the owner was randomly showing up without 24 hours notice, ka law, attempting to show the house with zero warning, and the best one, she started inspecting the house before we were even moved out. At this point, we were about 75% moved. The new house was on 12 1 2 acres, and we did not have a pen to put the horse and goats into. One day, I get home from work, and we have to call a vet out. Owner's daughter, who used to own the horse, decided to give the horse and our two goats a year's worth of glucosamine supplements for the horse. We ended up with a several hundred dollar vet bill. So, we sped things up and ended up clearing a few weeks early. Because of this, there were a few odds and ends left behind including a wooden run-to for the goats. I spent about 500.00 on cleaning alone to make sure we got our deposit back. I even brought in a professional cleaning service to finish the house up. I spent many times moving from base, housing while military, this is common. So we complete the final walkthrough with the owner, and she seems happy. She says she will figure everything out and send me a check. Okay, cool. About four weeks after the original move-out date, I get a large manila envelope in the mail from the owner. Strange but okay cool. I open it, and she is trying to charge me in the neighborhood of 2500.00 on top of the 2000.00 deposit she is keeping. Okay lady, let's see what you got. In the envelope is about 10 small mailer envelopes, and about 300-ish pictures of various things on the property and in the house, along with a six-page letter outlining what I owe her for. So I start reading, couple hundred for trash removal including a list of items removed, and the receipt for removal, several hundred for paint. During the walkthrough, I offered to paint the rooms we had painted. One was an obnoxious cotton candy pink, and the owner said no, it was fine. There is also a charge for close to 3000.00 for brand new carpeting and high-end padding from Lowe's, as well as the receipt, and also an itemized charge for labor. I believe there were a few other items, but I don't have the paperwork in front of me. Now, my first reaction was pure rage. I was seeing red. I wrote the nastiest letter to her three different times and took a step back. She had threatened to take me to court. QMC. I pulled up California rental laws, and at the time, there was a great website that explained what an owner could legally charge you for. So I sat down, and I believe the entire letter I responded to her with was around 15 pages. The highlights? 
I was not responsible for the painting or labor associated with, as I provided the final inspection that did not note any issues with paint color. I was not responsible for the trash removal, as she listed one item that was ours, the plywood run to in the field, and the items actually listed were all her personal items removed from the detached barn, and it was not my responsibility. I was not responsible for paying the emergency plumbing repair, mentioned earlier, and I provided the bill and the fact it was an emergency, as it was flooding over half the property, and making entrance the property impossible. The best one was the last one, the carpets. So in her letter, she mentioned a horrible smell of cat urine, which she proceeds to explain occurred during the illegal inspections. She also had provided documentation on the cost of materials, including all her purchases. The best part? They were all dated prior to our final walkthrough. No matter the result, she was replacing that carpet. So, California law is very specific on what the owner can charge for carpets. At the final walkthrough, she was okay with the carpets, but then changed her mind a few days later. So, I explained to the letter that I was responsible for roughly 1 slash 30th of the cost of replacement, as she graciously showed me the 10-year-old carpet was good for 30 years. So, due to the fact it was normal wear and tear, I agreed to cover that portion, it was only a couple hundred. Now in her letter, she threatened legal action as well. So, I put everything together, including a final breakdown of what was owed to her and what was owed to me, and it was close to 1,500.00. I also informed her I was ready to take the case to court if she didn't agree with me, as that was the next legal step. About a month later, she had 30 days to respond, I get a check for 1,250.00, and a short note saying she expected this issue, was considered resolved. I have never smiled so much cashing a check. Last one is titled, Supervisor Handoff. So this was around 17 years ago, but reading a bunch of these posts made me think about it all over again. I was an overnight supervisor at a steak and shake in Florida, making nine bucks an hour to essentially supervise myself doing all positions in the kitchen at the same time, while our one server handled everything in the dining room. One of the policies of the store was that no supervisor or manager could leave until their relief manager showed up. I come to work on a Tuesday night for a shift that goes from around 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. Do the normal thing and my relief manager doesn't show up. So I just stayed. Breakfast shift comes in. I continue to operate in the capacity I'm in. I'm 19 at the time and have some kind of sleep disorder that allows me to run on very little sleep. So I just roll with it. The breakfast manager never showed up and the GM didn't bother coming in that day. 10 p.m. rolls around again, which would have been the start of my shift all over again, so I'm still stuck there. At this point, I have dragged a stool from the back room to the kitchen, so I can rest my feet, but I'm otherwise attentive and continue to process orders in a timely fashion. Shift hash to draw us to a close. GM was scheduled to come in for that morning, flaked on it. Now, I'm on my second day straight being in this building, and no relief comes. We're back to my shift again. I'm some weird combination of exhausted and livid. 8 a.m. rolls around again for the third time and my GM comes in as the breakfast relief manager. I can only imagine I looked horrible, but he somehow found it in him to complain that the sourdough bread wasn't stocked. Told him it was stocked two days ago, clocked out, and slept in my car in the adjoining Walmart parking lot because I didn't trust myself on the road. The rest of the week played out as normal. Q later on in that week. The AGM pulls me into the back office to have a talk with me. She was going over payroll and was deeply confused as to how my $9 an hour self-out earned everyone this week. I explained working two days straight will do that and how I didn't have a choice given the policy. To her credit, she wasn't angry but astonished. It was a rather glorious paycheck to my teenaged self. Thanks for listening.